let's see okay perfect hey guys welcome to day 17 we're almost finished um and i'm excited just a few homework reminders is that for this week we're reading a book called god is my god is a matchmaker or god is my matchmaker by Derek prince you can find this book on amazon or anywhere books are sold but go and grab the book if you have not already it's a super quick read but it's very 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 powerful and um, the first week we read a book called Reverse the Curse by Annette Capps. The second week we read Deliverance from Demonic Covenants and Curses by Reverend James Solomon. Um, in between all of these, we read the Deliverance books. Um, he came to set the captives free, which is a deliverance manual by um, Bev Tucker. And right now we are reading uh, God is My Matchmaker by Derek Prince. So such a powerful book. I think it's going to be a very big blessing to those of you that are reading it. And those of you that are just joining this fast and you're like, Tiffany, I just, I'm just kind of jumping on day 17. Where should I start? You should start at day one because it is always pointless to do a fast if you're not going to do the work to till the land, you know, dig up the fallow ground and make sure that what you're planning on is a firm foundation. And so um, repentance and bloodline repentance and iniquity repentance and all of that stuff, which is what we did at the very beginning of the book, or the very beginning of the fast, is just going to be very powerful for you to do. So make sure that you get on top of that. Um, also, I will be, um, you know, I believe that the year of the bride fast is something that you all can be doing forever, right? Whether you are single, engaged, married, widowed, separated, divorced, bitter, angry, say you don't ever want a man, don't ever want a woman ever again in your life. I believe that this is a fast that is what we have learned is more than just a fasting for marriages, but this is fast that God is literally bringing him back to you. Like he's bringing you back to himself. This is a fast where we're literally coming back to our first love. Because in the book of Revelations 2, he says, like, I love all of the work you're doing in the kingdom. I love all of the ministry work that you're doing. But I have one thing against you, and that's that you left your first love. And in the Message Bible, he said, um, the fall that you took when you left your first love was a Lucifer fall. That is how big God saw the fall of you going through the motions of doing ministry and you going through the motions of entrepreneurship and you going through the motions of being a wife or a husband or a child or um, business is that you can be so busy doing what you think is right, but you've left your first love. You've left the intimate place of God, right? Some of you only study the Bible to teach people what you studied. A lot of ministers do that because they've left their first love. And so um, I would say that this is a powerful fast. This fast, literally, if you really go back through it, answers a lot of questions. I think many of you should go back through this fast from day one with a partner or by yourself at the top of the year. I think that this is something you should be doing once every quarter. With that being said, uh, I will be finished with the Year of the Bride book. It will be back on Amazon. Um, and that's because I really wanted to get all of the prayers out for the book as well. It's going to be such an easy read, but most importantly, I wanted all of the prayers to be written out and things of that nature. So I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised. We sprinkled some very powerful testimonies in between these things. And so the book will be on Amazon and uh, you'll be able to refer back to it in book mode, really like a manual Um you know, as much as possible. So we thank God for that. Now for the last leg of this fast, we are definitely going to be um, giving to the poor very aggressively. It is very pointless to be fasting um, if you're not doing several things. Sometimes people fast and life gets so busy that you end up fasting, but you um, you don't pray throughout the fast because you got so busy or you don't read the word of God because you get too busy. You don't get to the poor. You don't worship because you get too busy. And so just as a reminder, you know, you definitely want to be taking time out during a time of fasting to pray, to spend time with God, to worship God, to praise God, lots of repentance and giving to the poor aggressively. Also Thanksgiving very aggressively as well. And so um, before we get started with today's lesson, because I really want to keep um, the rest of these pretty short because of I think there's so much to study. I don't want to take your time of watching a video. But number one, let me say this about giving. For whatever reason, when it, whenever it gets time to give, 
you know, we tend to just lose our minds concerning giving. We don't know who's poor anymore. We don't know who the right person to give is anymore. We just got all the questions in the world about giving. And um, it's very simple, right? God says, give to the poor, you give to the poor. If you don't know what the poor is, that's something that you might need to go back to God and refer to, but it's definitely not you and the McDonald's line paying it forward to the people in front of you, right? They're not poor. You're just doing a very nice and kind thing, but it is not giving to the poor. Now, some of you also, I'm not getting ready to read the comments about what counts as giving to the poor. You guys are fully grown. We all know what giving to the poor looks like. We know what giving to the poor means. And if you don't know, now is a great time to partner up with your friend, the Holy Spirit, and ask him what he considers poor. Okay, now here's the thing about this. Many people have obviously preconceived notions of the poor, which is why God um, I think it's so against people who don't like the poor. We tend to scoff at the poor. We tend to not like being around the poor and things of that nature. Um, and so then we tend to say, well, I don't want to give to the poor because what if they do this with my money? Well, that's none of your business. That's similar to if God tells somebody to bless you right now, because here's the thing about God. We often think it's God that gives us the answer, which he can, but God literally, um, God literally sends people. That's why we're the body right? Of Christ. If God always did it himself, we wouldn't need people to get things done. And so what God does is like right now you are bombarding heaven for an answer. Right now there's a destiny helper that is sleep, not answering your prayers, right? Now, what if that destiny helper said, I don't want to answer Sarah's prayers because what if she do something wrong with them? Well, that's none of their business. Their business is to get the information from God to get it to you. And then God is going to hold you accountable for what you do with what you prayed for. He's going to watch and see how you steward the blessing for him to either say, well done, not good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over this little. I'm going to make you rule over many. Or he's going to say, you did wrong by it. I'm going to gnash your teeth, right? Your job is not to kind of Count, like the person that's holding on to your blessing right now, their job is not to say, what if she don't treat that man right? What if he don't treat that woman right? That's not their job. Their job was to obey God. God said, hook them up. Their job was to hook them up. What them to do with the hookup is between them two, but you did your job. You understand? Same goes for the poor. Your job is not to say, well, what if they do drugs with my money? What if they do this with my money? That's between them and God. That don't have nothing to do with you. Your job is to give, like God said, give. Now, the reason why I believe um, in aggressive forgiving, uh, aggressive giving to the poor, let me tell you what happened to me one day. One day, my daughter was like two, I think, three, four, five, one of the majors. And y'all know I worked in a nightclub for 10 years before I got saved. And I was working at a nightclub, and it was one of those nights I was coming home from work. It was like four o'clock in the morning. It was like raining cats and dogs outside. And I remember I was driving in my car. I just picked my daughter up from her babysitter. And so normally I had some type of weapon on me. This day I didn't have anything on me for whatever reason. I didn't have a knife in the car, nothing. And so I'm driving home. It is pouring cats and dogs. And I remember seeing this lady walking outside by herself. Mind you, it's four o'clock in the morning. And I don't really live in the hood at the time, but it ain't the suburbs. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm right in between seasons. And so here I am driving and I hear a voice. I'm not saved at the time, but I'm positive this is God that says, stop, pick her up and take her where she needs to go. Me, I'm like, I can't pick that lady up. I don't have no knife. I don't have to fist fight her. You know, you driving, it's already raining cats and dogs. You got to have two wheels on a wheel. What if she hit me on the head? I ain't going to be able to hit her back right. You know what I'm saying? Because there's a right way and a wrong way to hit somebody back. I got my daughter in the back. She's asleep. It's too much, too much I got to think about. I can't pick her up. Find somebody else to get somebody else to do it. And I remember, like, I remember the Holy Spirit giving me a scenario. What I knew for sure is that this lady had just run away from an abusive relationship. This wasn't just a regular homeless person that was just in the street. This person sp specifically, like, it's like the word of knowledge came through. She had just left an abusive relationship and she had nowhere to go and she was trying to find a phone. I knew that. Like that was a that was something the Holy Spirit told me. But because I wasn't like sure about the voice of God, I was not saved, none of that. I was like, why? First of all, why do I know this about this stranger? Number one. Number two, 
I'm not picking her up. I don't have a knife on me. I'm gonna have to fight this lady. No, I got too much money on me too. I just got from, I just came from work. I'm not no stripper, but I make money like one. I'm not picking this lady up. I got to go home. I go home, y'all. I park in my apartment par complex. I go upstairs to my bed. I cannot sleep. I cannot get any rest. Like the Holy Spirit is not giving me any sleep. I'm tossing and turning thinking about this lady walking on the side of the road. And I'm not that kind of person at the time that's thinking about nobody walking. Like where I live, sometimes you saw some homeless people here and there. I'm just not the person at the time that cares about seeing somebody. Y'all, I literally go try to go to sleep. I can't sleep for the rest of the night. I don't even think I sleep until the sun comes up. But I literally never go back down and pick this lady up. Y'all, the next day I got back in my car. And when I tell you I turned the ignition and that thing did not turn on, <laughs> for sure. Here's the thing. It's one thing for you to know your car is not working because something's wrong with it. It's another thing, baby, when you turn that ignition and you know you done made God mad. <laughs> you know for sure. I knew for a fact why my car wouldn't turn on. There was no question. No ifs, no ands, no buts. Baby, I had them piss God off. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? I heard God clearly is what he told me that day when I, my nation did. I don't think my car worked for a full month after that. For a full month, I did not have a car and I knew I was in trouble with God. And I wasn't saved and I knew I was in trouble with God. But let me tell you what that taught me. Let me tell you what, what's so funny about this story is I think after I got my car working, uh, my daughter at this time had probably heard me tell this story a million times. And I think maybe a year later, I saw this lady walking on the side of the road in the rain. <laughs> I, I was already going too fast to go to stop already because I had cars behind me. Baby, when I tell you I hit me a U-turn, I gathered all the money I had on me. And Jada's like, you're doing that because of what happened that, with that other lady with the, with the rain. I said, that's exactly why I will forever give aggressively to anybody that God need me to give aggressively. I had given that lady all the money I had on me. I asked her if she needed help. Do you need a motel? Are you running from somebody that's trying to beat you? Do you need help in any way, ma'am? And she was like, no, I already got help. Like, this, a do, this, a, this is an answer prayer. This will hold us over for a month. Thank you. And I'm like, you're welcome. Phew. I live to tell a story another day. What is my point? God taught me a very valuable lesson early on, way before I got saved, about giving to the poor. And this is not to say I stop and give to every poor person I see in the world. That's not the case. Um, I do give a lot and I do make sure that I do it. But here's the analogy I got, because some people give when they feel like giving. And God said, Right now, gave him a $100 bill. He said when he became a multimillionaire, he bought that pastor a million-dollar house. Isn't that powerful? Mm -hmm. And so I want you all to understand that you don't know who you're giving to. It, you could be giving to an angel unaware. You could be giving to, like, you don't know who you're giving to. But I want you to understand that right now, somebody is asking God for a miracle, for uh, some type of money, some type of anything to help them out. And God said, you know what? I have my servant, Tiffany. Normally she makes a left on this street, but because she's so sensitive to me, I'm going to tell her to make a right. And when she sees you on the corner, she's going to give you the money that you're looking for. Because when she gets to the poor, she knows that she's just lending the money from me. I... She is my bank in the world. So when I give the money to her, she knows I'm going to give it back to her. Like, let me give you another powerful. Um... Wait, what analogy did y'all miss? You can watch the replay. You'll watch the replay. Another analogy, because whenever you give to the poor, it's you lending to God. It's you lending the money for God, right? He's going to pay you back, okay? And so one day I was at a ministerial event, and I always try to give on the low because the Bible says when you give in private, when you give secretly, God will reward you openly, okay? So one day I was at a ministry event, 
and I was trying to, I heard the Lord tell me to give somebody a thousand dollars. I was trying to gather my money um, without anybody noticing that I gathered the money. I put it in um, my hand, tried to hide it, and then I gave it to the person. Guess what, you guys? When I sat back down to my seat, it was not 30 seconds later that somebody walked up to me and she said, God told me to give you this, and it was $1,000. Do you know the person sitting next to me wept because she was watching me, but I didn't know she was watching me, and she knew I had given that person that kind of money, and she said, I had to see God give you back that immediately. Mm -hmm. Like, it was 30 seconds later that God gave me back a thousand dollars. And the lady specifically said, God told me to come and give you this right now. Wow. There have been times I have given five, 10,000. And then immediately within that day, somebody sold back to me five, 10,000. You got to understand? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the reason I think it was done is that she, the person next to me needed to see it done because she wept in a way that wasn't a normal week for that. Mm -hmm. That was something that maybe she toiled with with God yeah. and she needed to see that for some type of breakthrough. She needed to see God answer a prayer. Mm -hmm. It was almost like, it was like an exchange of here Tiffany's being obedient. She don't know why. She don't even care. Mm -hmm. And here somebody paid her back what she just gave. Wow. Like so powerful, wow. right? And so um, that's just to give you, now giving to the poor is different from you giving to tithe. That's the argument y'all can have. I don't like having that argument because people argue about, you know, giving their 10%. I give about 70%. Okay. So I'm not even having that futile argument about giving tithe, whether you should give it or not. I don't give 10% of my income. I give much more of my income to ministries, to churches, to God's ecclesia and all of that. That's an argument y'all can have with the Holy Ghost by yourself. Okay. Uh, but it, giving alms to the poor is different from giving that. And it's also different from giving, um, sowing seeds into ministries if that's what you choose to do, right? And so, yes, you all sow into covered by God whenever you feel led to do so. And on the last day of our fast, but um, I like to make sure that I'm teaching that giving to the poor is very important according to Isaiah 58. And we want to make sure we keep that in mind. Now, a few things I want you to know really quickly, because our live today is pretty short, but I want you to go to Psalms 41. And the Bible has a promise. And he says, um, blessed is he that considereth the poor, for the, the Lord will deliver him in a time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and the Lord will not deliver him to the, into the will of his enemies. This means that you have a very powerful promise that all of the people praying against you, God promised that he will not deliver you over to the will of your enemies because you've considered the poor, okay? Now, I wanna just break down the word alive. He said, because the Lord will preserve you and keep you alive. The word alive means to live prosperously. The word alive means to be restored to health or life. The word alive means to be revived from sickness, from discouragement or from death. And it means to recover and repair, okay? So I want you to look up this on your own. You can read Psalms 41, it's only 13 verses. And that's that, but it's a very powerful uh, message. Also Acts chapter 10, let's go there very quickly. Acts chapter 10, there was a man by the name of Cornelius. And um, when you go to verse two, the Bible says he was a devout man, one that feared God with all of his house. And he gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. This was a man that gave the, to the poor all the time. And he prayed to God always. He, and he was also fasting. This is new covenant. He was also fasting. The Bible says in verse three, he saw a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of the Lord coming into him, coming into him and saying, Cornelius, um, when he saw the angel, he was afraid. And he said, your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before God. This means that the way he gave to the poor, God remembered him about something. Okay. So yes, everything that you're doing is very powerful, but I need you to know that Acts chapter 10 lets you know that there is a way you can give to the poor that will come up as a memorial before God. Now, many of you like Tiffany, I am the poor. How do I give to the poor if I'm the poor? And what I want you to, to change the narrative is, if, especially if you're a part of Covered by God and you're connected to me in any way, I want you to say to yourself, you are very wealthy in a poor situation right now. 
That's it. It's a, it's a simple change of perspective. You're a wealthy man. You're a wealthy woman that happens to be in a poor situation right now. Like when I first had my child, I was, I don't know why I say child like that. When I first had my, my youngin, I was sitting in a welfare office. Okay. Because I was like, I need some money. I need some type of welfare assistance. You know, I need some money. Do y'all understand? I went and sat in that welfare office and I looked to my left and I looked to my right. Now, I didn't have a pot to piss it in the window to throw it out of. I didn't have two nickels to rub down to my name. I was, I had a neon back in the day. I called her Neona. Okay. Remember Neona? I remember Neona. Neona got us where we had to go. Okay. <laughs> Neona ain't have no AC in the car. So I had to put frozen vegetable baggages on like Jada's legs so she would not overheat in my, in this North Carolina heat. Okay. I had to, I had, you know, how you had the Mott's apple juice. I had that filled up with coins to put gas in my gas, in my gas tank. When I say I was poor, I was, I was doing everything but slinging around this pole because I'm just too skinny to do that. You know what I'm saying? But not at the white people, not at the white people one. I would have been, I would have been a star. <laughs> I would have been a star. Okay. Back to what I was saying. I try to come on here at at right sometimes, but it never, never works out the way I intend. I'm sitting in the welfare office, okay? I'm looking to the left. I'm looking to the right. And I say to myself, I don't belong here. I literally say to myself, I don't, I am not these people. Now, my situation was these people because I didn't have no money. Matter of fact, somebody in there made it have more money than me. But I looked at them and I said, I'm not supposed to be here because what I knew for sure is that the welfare office would have kept me bound to that system for too long. And I would have become dependent on that system as an idol for too long because they would have been my God. And I wasn't serving God like that back then, but I did know for sure that I didn't belong there. There are sometimes you got to look in the environment you are right now. You have to look at the, the people that you're around right now. You need to look at your circle of friends that you're around right now. You need to look at that man you're dating right now or the woman you're dating right now. You need to say, I don't belong here. Some of y'all right now is in somebody's bed, depending on what time zone we in, okay? And you watching this on a low because he's, he's sleeping next to you. And you need to look up and say, I don't belong here right now, right? That's what this is about. I don't belong here. So you are a wife stuck in a side chick position right now, okay? You are a wife stuck in a... Okay, I was gonna sing that too. I'm glad you said it, so I'm gonna just say it. She's a hoe, ho, she's a hoe. I said you is a hoe. Now, let me tell you something about not sending me no emails because in the book of Revelations, he called you whores, okay? Y'all send me an email every day. I keep saying, don't send me no email. Don't send me no email. Don't send me no email. And about 17,000 of y'all still send me emails. The Lord just wants me to rebuke you for calling us stupid. Baby, he called you a whore. Me calling you stupid is the least of your worries. It's literally the least. You should thank me. You should say, thank you, God, that you sent your daughter to call me stupid for sleeping with somebody else's husband. Because the truth is, if she didn't do it, I was really delving down a demonic death covenant of sleeping with somebody's husband because you was going to get me a lot worse than her calling me stupid. Some things y'all should just thank me for instead of be stuck in the, in the spirit of offense. But, you know, Revelation called you a hoe. I'm going to call you a hoe. He actually said whore, but I'm going to just say hoe because we're in 2023 going into 2024. You know what I'm saying? But you're not, Okay? Let's just be clear. And so my point is... You are wealthy in a poor position. So stop saying that you're poor. You are the poor. You need somebody to give to you. I need you to get $2 together and give to the poor. Give them a hug. I don't know. Stop and give them a conversation. Look them in their face and give them a God bless you. Look that if you don't have any money, literally, like if you're like really like not having, get, look them, look, go stop and say, you know what? I'm going to go and pray for five people today. And let me just say this, like my $1,000 don't count for nothing because I'm a multimillionaire now. But somebody's $100, somebody's $10 to God means more to God than my $1,000 meant. You understand what I'm saying to you? So don't look down on what you have because it's all you have because you're comparing it to what somebody else has. My $1,000 means nothing to God compared to your $5 that that's all you had. And you say, I'm going to sow this into the poor. You understand what I'm saying? So in God's kingdom, it doesn't make sense. 
But stop comparing what I'm able to do for somebody to what you're not able to do because it, it's the heart posture of it all. I'm telling you, baby, your $1 will run circles around my $1,000 to God. To God. So just keep that in mind. Um, yeah, so just give to the poor. You guys can get, you know, with the Holy Ghost on what the poor is and all of that. Let's go to Genesis chapter 24 really quickly. You're going to read this on your own, but let me give you a breakdown. Abraham is trying to find his son a wife before he dies. Um, he sends his servant out to go and find the son and they make a covenant with each other in verse two. How do, that, how do I know they make a covenant? Well, anytime in the Bible, somebody put their hand under their thigh, that was um, that's representative of a covenant that is being made. In Genesis chapter 24, you're gonna read the entire chapter on your own. I'm just gonna give you some quick cliff notes because this chapter is very juicy. Abraham is trying to find his son a wife and he's like, um, he sends his servant out to do that. Now his servant in verse five says, now what if the woman that I go and find is not willing to find me? Now this is for all of you that believe that God told you that a certain man or a certain woman was your wife or your husband. And you're like, okay, God, well, this person said that they're not my spouse. What do I do? You know, you said that this was it, but this person is not following along. And verse five, he says, if the person is not willing to find you, the covenant is off. You are clear from this oath. He says that in verse eight. If this person is not willing to follow you, the covenant is over. You are clear from this oath. That's verse eight. Verse five and verse eight says that. So verse seven, he says, Lord God of heaven, which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred. So he's saying God who moved mountains for me, God who promised me everything. You took me Abraham said, you took me out of my father's house. Remember that his father's name was Terah. You can find this in Genesis chapter 11. Abraham's father was an, not just an idol worshiper. He's also an idol maker. He was also somebody that had a store and he built idols with his own hands. He came from a family of voodoo, of witchcraft, of the occult, of, of, of witch doctors, of high satanic activity. That's where Abraham is from. This is why Abraham's story should make all of you full of hope and full of joy that God can, you don't have to be perfect to be in the kingdom. God, if he can take a man like Abraham and do all of the things that he's done with them, surely he can do it with you, even with your background. So what Abraham's doing in verse seven is saying, God who took me from my father's house. That's why you need to know what his father's house was to let you know what he's saying to God. God, you were the one that could, his father's name meant delay. Tara meant delay or in other words, stationed which is why it took so long for Abraham and Sarah to have a baby because by what the covenant was on his bloodline, he was reaping the consequences of his father being an idol worshiper until he broke those covenants. So what he's saying is, God, you are the one that took me out of this spirit of delay. You are the one that took me out of my father's house. You took me out of a house that practiced voodoo, hoodoo, witchcraft, high level Satanism, high level occult. That's what you did for me. You took me out of the land of my kindred. Remember, he was with Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. You took me out of that. Only you could have done that for me. This is how you're going to approach God for day 17. You're going to say, God, you took me out of my mother and father's house. You took me out of the land. You took me out of that man's bed. You took me out of a sick bed. You took me out of that man's bed. You took me out of that woman's bed. You delivered me out of, a, out of the hand of a warlock. You delivered me out of the hand of a witch. You brought me out of a house of idolatry, of Freemasonry, of all of these things that I didn't know existed. You did that for me. And you spoke unto me and you swore to me, God, unto my seed will I give you this land. And he shall send his angel before thee and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. Here's what I want you to notice. In verse seven, he said, he's gonna send an angel before you and you're gonna take a wife to, here's the thing. This is what's so exciting about angels that we don't be knowing about. I need y'all to do a study on angels. You know what I'm saying? Like a real study on angels. But this angel was assigned to go before the servant to help find the wife. This angel was assigned to take anything that was in the path out of the way. This angel was assigned to prepare the way. Now, here's the definition of the word angel that I all want you to look up. This is a Hebrew definition of the word angel. One of the definitions is a dis to dispatch as a deputy. This is the word angel, y'all, in the Hebrew definition. I told y'all how to look up these words in the Blue Letter Bible app, the concordance. 
The word angel means to be dispatched as a deputy. This angel was dispatched as a deputy, y'all, to go and make this matchmaking thing come to pass. Angel also means messenger. Angel also means representative. And it also means an ambassador. You can look those words up on your own, but wow, is this exciting. This angel went out as a, was dispatched as a deputy marshal. I just added on Marshall, but you know what I'm saying? This angel was, was sent out as a representative, as an ambassador or as a messenger and said, you're going to take you up a wife. That's when he said, well, what if she's not willing to come? He said, if she's not willing to come, you're free from this oath. So that should free all of you that hear God saying somebody is your spouse and they're not in agreement with it, you know? Now, verse 12, we're going to go down some. You can read this on your own. This is where the servant is talking to God. And he says, God of my master, Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master, Abraham. The word good speed, you get this? Ready for this? This is exciting. Send me good speed this way. The word good speed means I need an encounter with this woman. The word good speed means come to meet. The word good speed means to meet without a prearrangement, which means that this is a surprise. This is a surprise. Somebody says, but didn't Amos marry Gomer and she wasn't cooperating? Sure. But this is to free those that say, what if the person does not come into agreement with me, God? And he said, you're free from this oath. So with Gomer and, uh, and the other lady, God told them you can't move from this oath. There is no oath you can be free from. You got to do this whether you want to do it or not. I think that's the difference. Here, he said, what if the person doesn't do it? And he said, you're free from the oath. So you got to keep that in mind. If God is telling you you're not free from this oath, no matter what, you got to listen to God. But God gives us free will. In that specific case, he did not give him free will. And so that's when we know that God is sovereign. In some cases, God gives us free will. In other cases, God does not give us free will. Our job, because we are filled with the Holy Ghost, especially by day 17, you should be. You should be hearing the voice of God to say, you're bound to this, no matter if this person agrees or not, or not. If this person does not agree, they have free will, you're released from this oath. So that's between you and God to see which one is which. I just wanted to free the people that needed to be freed from being bound. So he says, send me good speed this day. Good speed means to meet without prearrangement. This means that this is not, this is a surprise meetup. This person doesn't know that this is happening. This is a surprise. But here's what's exciting, y'all. This good speed also means we're in verse 12. To build with beams or to lay beams. And it also means to impose timbers for a roof or a floor. Because we just got done framing yesterday. We just got done breaking ground on day nine. All of the first week, day one through seven, we were telling the land. We were digging up the land. Verse day nine, we got to dig breaking ground. Yesterday, okay, day 16, we started framing. Now he's letting us know that good speed means to build with beams, to lay beams, to impose timbers for a roof or a floor. Are you as excited as I am? I hope so, because this is too much for me right now. Send me good speed also means to light upon. And we've been declaring, let there be light. We just did it yesterday. We just did it yesterday. Let there be light. Oh, how exciting is this? And then he says, show kindness to my master. The word kindness means show faithfulness, show favor to him. Show favor to him. So we're going to be praying, God, excuse me, we're going to be praying. Somebody said, this is better than Netflix, baby, I'm telling you, okay? We're going to be praying, God, send us good speed this day, now, not tomorrow, not next year. Send good speed this day. Send good speed this day. What does this mean? We need an encounter with our spouse this day. We need a meeting place for us to come to meet this day. We need, uh, we need to meet without prearrangement this day. We need 
to build the beat with beams and lay beams. God, I need you. We frame the house. We, we, we will continue to frame this house, but we need you to impose timbers for the roof or the floor of this house this day. We need you to light upon this structure this day, and we need you to send out the angel of the Lord as a deputy dispatched to make this meeting come to pass. We need you to send out the representative of you, God, to make this meeting come to pass. I need an encounter. We need a meetup. It can be a surprise for the both of us, but we need it to happen. Um, you can read the rest on your own. Oh, let me say this because I thought that this was very powerful. In verse 14, he actually asked God for confirmation. And he said, if this is the wife, I ask that she gives me and the cattle some water. As soon as he got there, you guys, guess what happened? There was one woman that came out by the name of Rebecca and she gave him and the cattle some water. This is how we knew it was her. This is so good. So I pray that you know what I'm talking about. Okay, go with me to 1 Kings 18 because today is about supernatural speed. And if he did it before in scripture, we have proof that he will do it again. Okay, verse, verse 1 Kings 18. This is a story about prophet Elijah. A few chapters before, he declared that there be no rain and there was no rain for a span of three and a half years. Verse 18, uh, because of idolatry on the land. Now he was going up against the prophets of Baal, B-A-A-L-L, -L, and Baal back in that day was the weather God. He was responsible for, um, they thought he was responsible for the rain and all of that. So God was like, okay, that's your God. Let me go ahead and not make it rain so you can dance like fools in front of your God. And um, let's see if your God will make it rain. And he did not because he could not, okay? And so here God has prophet Elijah do a showdown with the prophets of Baal, which is the weather God, because this is all about the rain. Now, here's a beautiful thing about this, because you guys will be watching a live that I did with Pastor Nathaniel Bassey and um, um, Victoria Orenzi called, what was it called? Torrential downpour marriages, something like that. And what we're believing God for is the rain, okay? It is the rain of marriages. And so here you have the prophets of Baal in our generation that are condoning same-sex marriages, that are telling people they don't have to be married, blah, blah, blah. And here we are as prophets of God declaring that there is an abundance of the sound of rain. But before we do that, we have to tear down the structures and the systems of the prophets of Baal that are declaring another kind of rain, torrents of rain. Thank you guys so much for the name of it. So you're going to read all of 1 Kings 18 for today. But for the sake of my cliff notes, I want you to go to verse 21. And he says, and Elijah came to all the people and said, how long will you halt between two opinions? How long will you halt between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if your baby daddy be God, then follow him. If, if, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if that side dude you sleeping with or that side chick you sleeping with be God, follow them. If God be God, follow him. But if that man you having sex with outside of marriage be God, follow him. And the people it didn't have a word for him. That's what the Bible was saying. The people answered him not a word. Just like many of you doing right now. Because there comes a point where you need to make a decision. I believe that this is that point. Who is on the Lord's side? Some of you will say, I'm not on the Lord's side right now. I'm on this dude's side. You need to make a decision. So you're going to read on and on. And he says in verse 24, call on the name of your God. And I'm going to call on the name of my God. And the God that answered by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken, right? You call on the name of your God and I'm going to call on the name of mine. Whoever's God is going to be God. Now, I want you to understand how impossible he made this. He said, you know what? I'm going to give you an advantage. This is how I'm sure about my God I am. And I'm going to pour water on my logs because we're believing God is going to answer by fire. And, you know, it's pretty impossible to set something on fire that's soaking wet. But because I believe in my God, I'm going to make, I'm going to give you the advantage. That's how little I believe in your God. And I'm going to make mine soaking wet with water. So what did they, the prophets of Baal got to acting stupid. They started cutting themselves, mutilating themselves, butchering themselves, dancing around, making a lot of noise. And we find that prophet Elijah in verse 27 mocked them, which is why I'd be so blown away whenever I start mocking, you know, false prophets. Y'all be so mad at me. And I'm like, in the scripture, he mocked them because that's what they deserve. They deserve to be mocked, right? He mocked them. 
And then um, verse 28 says, they cut themselves in all manners with knives and blush, uh, gut, bl blood gushed out of them and all of those things. And when, it, when they were finished, verse 30 is Elijah's turn. The first thing he did was he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. This is what we're doing with this fast. We're repairing altars back to God that people in our bloodline broke down generations ago. You understand? Generations ago, these people broke these altars to God. And right now we are literally repairing these altars back like he did in verse 30. So before he went up against them, he repaired the altar back. Okay. And so um, you can read what he did. Blah, blah, blah. Whoop de whoop. Verse 20, 36. He said, and I want you to read this because this is, I take this specific scripture in a prayer a lot, but it's verse 36. He says, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am just your servant, Tiffany, that I have done all of these things according to your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are God and that thou has turned their heart back again. The Bible says in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trenches. Now, let me read this in the um, verse 36 because it's another version I want to read you in um, 1 Kings 18, 36. Let me see if it's in the Amplified version because he says, Mom, that it be seen that this is so I've done according to the word. That I need to, that's not it. Maybe it's in the, because I know the version by heart in my mind. Like I've done according to the word. I let it be seen that this is so. Nope, can't find it. Anyway, that's the scripture I pray. I've done according to your word and I let it be seen that this is so, you know? And so anywho, um, he repaired, let me go back to, he repaired the altar that was broken. The word repair there, I want you to go to your um, blue letter Bible app because the word repair means some very powerful things. He repaired the altar, just like you're going to be called the repairer of the breach, right? In verse, in Isaiah 58, you're going to be called the repairer of the breach. The word repair, when he says he repaired the altar, it means that he made health again. He healed it. Um, it was a physician that healed it. It also means of hurts of nations involving restored favor. Okay. It means pottery because he's the potter and we're just the clay. That he healed national hurts, literal hurts of a person. He healed the personal distress of a bloodline. And it means to cure, to repair, to make whole, and to mend. So I want you to keep that in mind that while we are on this fast, we are repairing broken altars that were broken down, but it is literally like powerful. This is the Strong's Concordance. The, the concordance in the Blue Letter Bible app is the Strong's Concordance, just FYI. And um, when he says, how long will you halt between two opinions? I want you to know that the word opinions mean double-mindedness. It means two thoughts. So right now you can't figure out what, what you should be doing. You're double-minded. The Bible says that the double-minded man or a woman is unstable in all of their ways. As long as you're in a, a season of double-mindedness, he's asking you how long will you halt between two opinions, okay? And so the Bible also says that after he, he wins that and the fire hits the altar, the people saw it, they fall on their faces, and God uh, and Elijah kills the prophets of Baal. And he says in verse 41, and Elijah says to Ahab, get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of an abundance of rain. We're believing God during this fast that there is a sound of an abundance of what this generation has been desolate of, which is the rain of marriages, okay? There is a sound of 
because here they were, they had gone into a drought or a famine of water. And in our generation, we've gone into a drought and famine of marriages. And so we're declaring after we have gotten victory and repaired the broken breaches, there is a sound of an abundance of marital, of torrents of marriages. There's just a sound of it. Now the word sound means voice because Elijah didn't wait for a new season to come. He proclaimed the new season out of his mouth. I taught a very powerful message I covered by God called your schedule for your new season. Okay. Very powerful message. You're scheduled for your new season. Let me say this as a caveat because it's been a lot of people that, you know, make videos about me because of what I said during that live. And during that live, there was a witch that was coming against me while I was praying. And I got up and I looked in the camera and I said, if you don't repent by midnight, I forgot what I said. I said, you're going to die or something. I believe. Yeah, you're going to die. And many people got mad and said I had killed the lady or I, I sent curses out and I do death. And I want to say, just as God is a witness, I've never prayed for anybody to die in my life during prayer. I don't have to do that. I just don't do it. I fear God too much for that. But let me give you what it, what's an example because I am a prophet of God. So what people didn't know is about what, the God, what God revealed to me about that woman is that she was responsible for a lot of witchcraft against ministers and against ministries. That's what that person was. And it's no different than me seeing somebody steal something all the time and then me saying to that person, if you don't repent, you got because God is going to give you mercy until midnight. If you don't repent, you're going to jail for 20 years for something you didn't do. That's not me putting a curse on that person. That's me as a prophet of God showing them what's going to happen if they don't take this, this span of time of mercy because I heard God say it. You understand? So as you watch that live and you hear me say that and all of a sudden you get your panties in a bunch because you're mad about it. What God was showing that person was mercy. I didn't wish death on that person. What I said was what I heard, which was, if you don't repent, this is what's going to happen to you because you got to come in anyway. But this is mercy. Now, somebody is going to, somebody already said, well, is she dead and all of that? I don't know because I don't know what anybody's doing after I give them a prophetic word, unless I ask God about what they're doing after I give them a prophetic word. Um, I've been saved since 2015. Over that time, I have given probably thousands of people prophetic word. I don't go back to see if the prophetic word I gave them comes to pass. I give the word, I shake the dust off of my feet and I keep it moving, right? That's what we do. And so um, that's up. If you guys want to waste your time trying to figure that out, you figure that out. But we do, again, thank you for the analogy. We have Ananias and Sapphira, which is new covenant. Ananias and Sapphira was a husband and wife team who lied to one of the disciples. And what they did not know is that they lied to the Holy Ghost. This is new covenant I'm talking about. This is not, we're not in Old Testament no more. This is new covenant. Ananias and Sapphira lied to a person, but what they didn't know is that they lied to the Holy Ghost. And when the husband came in, he told his wife to lie about the money. The husband came, lied about the money. The Bible says he gave up the ghost. He died on the spot. Now the wife came behind him and had time to not do what her husband did, right? But because she was a submissive woman, because we, we don't teach it right, because don't nobody read the Bible no more. Because she submitted to her husband, because we are, we are to submit to our husbands as long as they're submitted to God. But the second your husband comes out of agreement with God and no longer submits to the word of God, God, the covenant you have with God usurps the covenant you have with your husband. We have proof of that with Ananias and Sapphira because when she came from around and she did what many of you do, which is she listened to her husband and not God no more, and her husband's dead. She don't know it, but she lied because her husband told her to. Guess what happened to her? The Bible says she gave up the ghost too. She lied to the Holy Ghost thinking she lied to a person and she dropped dead. So when I said to that person, repent, because this is what I see for you. That's mercy. Because nobody even warned Ananias and Sapphira. They didn't say to them, repent. They just said, let me lie. And they gave up the ghost. So I say that to say, the live is called um, your schedule for your new season. It is a very powerful live. Very powerful live. Your schedule for your new season. And um, I want you to watch that, but also keep in mind that I did say that and I stand 10 toes down on what I said because I heard God say it. And that's just what it is. If y'all have a problem with it, you should probably tell these witches to stop putting curses on men and women of God. How about that? I think y'all should start getting more mad at witches and what they got going on than this. And you might even say, Tiffany, you know, do you pray for witches to get healed and delivered? Plenty of them are covered by God. Plenty of them serve at cover by God.
that were once in high level witchcraft and they turned their lives around. So my life is fruit and the ministry that God gifted us with is fruit that um, we happily take in people with all different types of backgrounds. But baby, not while you in it, okay? You want a war, I'm gonna give you one. So that's what it is. There is a sound of an abundance of rain. The word sound means voice. The word sound means thundering. The word sound means to sing and proclaim because the kingdom that we live in is voice activated. As long as you're quiet and you're just reading scriptures and you're not declaring, like you should be framing your world with the word of God at every chance you get. You need to be doing your confessions. You need to be speaking the word of God over your life and over all of this stuff that we got going on. And he says, I hear an abundance of rain. The word abundance means a wealth of it or a roar. It also means the word roar. Um, Here's the point about speed. You might be saying, well, why are we reading this in today's supernatural speed? We just got done reading Genesis chapter 24. But one thing I want you to take into, take into account is, um, is number one in verse 43, he tells his servant, well, first of all, he responds well, because there's always a response when God gives you an answer to your prayer. And he responded by putting his face between his knees, which was a posture of worship, right? In verse 43, he tells his servant, I now need you to go up and look towards the sea. And when the servant went up, he said, I don't see nothing up there because now he's declared out of his mouth, there's a sound of an abundance of rain. Now, if God tells you right now, you're going to get married and he's like, I need you to go out there and see you like now my phone is still dry. God, I don't see no man in sight. I don't see a woman in sight. What's going to happen? And he said, I need you to go and look again seven times. And what I thought is powerful about this is, I don't know if you guys remember the, when Jericho happened, he made them circle it six times. And on the seventh, he made them say something right? He made them yell. He made them blow the trumpet. And so here you have an example of, I need you to go and look again seven times. He came on the seventh time and he said, behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. Now this does not equate to the abundance of rain that he heard. You understand? Like this doesn't equate to the abundance of rain that he heard and still, because prophet Elijah knew God, he knew that this was the answer to his prayer. So in our kingdom, you guys, when he says walk by, uh, walk by faith, not by sight, or walk by the spirit and not by your flesh, this means that it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what you can see with your natural eye. You don't go by that. You only go by what God said. If God said that there's a sound of an abundance of rain, if God said you're going to get married, if God said that your marriage is going to be fire branded, if God said that your marriage is going to be an answer to the earth, if God said that your your marriage is going to be miraculous, if God said that he's going to match make, match make you with your husband or your wife, if God said that you guys are going to be like a match and oil, like a, like a pure fire to this generation, if God said all of these things, it doesn't matter what you see. It doesn't matter what you hear. It doesn't matter what you smell. It doesn't matter what you're touching. None of that matters. Only thing that matters is what God said. That's how you walk by faith and not by sight. Because if you hear an abundance of rain, but you only see a cloud the size of a man's hand, that does not equal to what God said. Okay. We only go by faith and not by sight. So it says in verse 44, when it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, behold, there's, you know, he said all that. He, Elijah said, Go up and say to Ahab, prepare thy chariot and get thee down that the rain stop thee not. Ain't no rain yet. But he now moved in faith to say, prepare the chariot and tell him, don't let the rain stop him. And I'm sure he looking at it like, I don't see no rain. Don't let the rain stop him. Verse 45 says, and it came to pass in the meanwhile that the heaven was black with clouds and wind and there was a great rain. This rain did not show up until he showed faith about this rain coming. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Verse 46 is what we're focusing on. It says, and the hand of the Lord was on Elijah and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. I want you to know that in this scripture, um, historians say that Ahab had about a day head start. This is the point of supernatural speed. Ahab had about a day head start to, to Elijah. And the Bible says that when the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah and he girded up his loins, he was able to run now ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Because when the hand of the Lord is upon you and you do all of these things, you break, you know, you tear down evil altars, you repair the altar in your bloodline. Whenever God restores something, you guys, I'm going to restore to you the years 
that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust stole from you. How you know God restores something is because he adds supernatural speed to it. That is how you know God restores something is that speed is added to it. God send me good speed this day. All throughout scripture, you'll see when God restores something, he adds speed to it. When I got saved in 2015, God added speed to my salvation story because he needed to restore the years that the canker room, the, loc the locusts and the palmer room stole probably from my bloodline from not doing this the right way, from polluting God's pulpit. I didn't go through the regular channels of ministry. God restored me so that I could get a lot done in a short amount of time and I could, I could, I could go back from the years that I, that, I, that I wasted in the world and I needed it to be restored. So for those of you that feel like you should have been married years ago, God is restoring those years back to you and it has to happen fast, right? It, though it may tarry, wait for it. And so I want you to just be discerning on this, if this is God tarrying or this is the devil. But if you've been having dreams of old houses, you've been having dreams of old schools or high schools and things of that nature, then of course, I want you to know that that is a spirit of delay operating in your life and things of that nature. So let me go ahead and get off because this has been buffering and I don't want it to end on you or whatever. I'll just finish the rest tomorrow. Um, I want you to grab your communion and all of that. And I want you to uh, remember that we are going to be watching a live call this up there it's over there let me give you the live that we'll be watching yeah got it okay the live is on my page called torrents of favor torrents of godly favor what I'm going to do is I am actually going to just repost it on my page. I'm going to repost it in the comments or whatever. Um, prophetic word on marriage. And so we're going to rewatch that. And then I want you, I'm going to put the link for your schedule for your new season in the comments. And remember, we're reading um, God is My Matchmaker by Derek Prince and things of that nature. So... Uh, yes, you can take communion. I'm taking it. I take it in remem remembrance of God. Oh, shoot, the body don't fall on the floor. Father, we discern the body in the name of Jesus Christ. We put ourselves in remembrance for what this represents. And we declare, God, that with every single stripe that you took, we are healed. With every stripe that you took, God, every lashing of your body, we are healed in our mind, in our reproductive system, in our wombs, in our hearts, in our relationships. Our marriages are healed, God. Our thoughts are healed. Our children are healed. Every stripe you took, God, is reminding us that we are already healed in the name of Jesus Christ. So now I want you to partake in this, knowing that every stripe that he took, every lashing he took, you are already healed in the name of Jesus Christ. And then, Father, we take the blood of Jesus and... Um, and we declare, God, that all of this is broken. Every curse is broken. Um, every anti-marriage curse on our bloodline is completely broken in the name of Jesus Christ. We take that. And um, that's all for now. I will, anything I forgot, I'll just add tomorrow. So I love you guys to life and see you tomorrow. Bye.